So I think this is this is all of us, um, and uh, so I guess we should start now. Uh, uh, I'm going to start myself. Um, okay. So uh, as you already know, this uh, workshop is called Advanced Secondary Analysis of Large Scale Assessments in Education, and we are going to have a, a discussion of uh, methods. Uh, as we already said, this uh, workshop is a uh, the, the people who is going to be talking to you, uh, telling you about these methods, is myself, Andres Sandoval, Diego Carrasco, and Daniel Miranda from Centro de Medición uh, in the uh, University of Ch uh, the Catholic University of Chile, and Pamela Inostrosa, who is in uh, KU Leuven. Um, so let's get started. Uh, we have around a bit more than uh, two hours. I'm going to give first a, a brief introduction about uh, uh, what is international large scale assessment data in general, and a few words about uh, the international civic and citizenship education study, which is the one that we're gonna be using for the examples. Um, then uh, Diego Carrasco is gonna talk to you about how to prepare data for M plus, which is the software that again, we're gonna be using for the, for the examples today. And then he will continue with a, an example analysis of latent class uh, uh, analysis uh, using uh, civic uh, data from the ICCS study. And Daniel Miranda will continue with an example on structural equation models. Uh, as, as we already said as well, you can post your questions in the chat. Uh, in case you have them, we are not that many people, so we were we were thinking we would uh, compile all the questions for the end of each section. But because we are not that many, I think uh, it is uh, probably makes more sense if you want to, uh, you have a question, just raise your hand using the tool uh, that Zoom provides, uh, and we we can uh, stop for a moment and, and try to address the the question. If it is something more complex or if you don't feel like doing the, the question uh, speaking, just put it uh, nevertheless in the chat and we will come to them uh, when we have uh, in each of the breaks. So- Andres, may I say something? Sorry. Of course. Uh, you will notice that in the reaction box, you cannot actually put up your hand. <laughs> so uh, uh, yeah, you can use any other symbol or just unmute yourself like I just did right now. I think that could be better if you want to speak directly. Sorry for the- No, thank you very much. I hadn't noticed that you cannot do that. We discovered earlier today, so it's good to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so yeah. You, you can um, tell us in the chat that you want to ask a question or you just wave at us and, uh, and, and we'll try to, to give you the, the, the word. Uh, okay, so yeah, uh, around 30 minutes for each type of analysis for each example and around 30 minutes for questions at the end. A bit less probably because we already took some 10 minutes from the introductory part. So. Uh, I'm not gonna make this very long because uh, most of you already know the basics about this, but there are some things that we have to discuss in order to be on the same ground, on the, uh, having the same understanding of some basic elements of what we're gonna be talking today. So this introduction to the uh, international large scale assessments. The first thing to say is that I think most of you, if not all of you know, of course, the, the data from uh, PISA, PISA is probably or surely the, the most popular international large scale assessment, but it's by far not the only study. We have many different assessments now. Uh, everything started back in the 60s with the IEA, which is the International Association for the Evaluation of Educational Achievement. And they, uh, they were the first the pioneers in this area. Uh, it started like, as a collaboration of academics. They met in a conference and they thought that it was a good idea to apply the same test to samples of students in different countries to be able to compare. From there to now, many things have happened. They started first uh, with these uh, preliminary studies and then in the modern age of uh, international assessments, they started with teams and perils, which are the, their two flag studies. Teams is about mathematics and science. Teams is about, perils is about reading literacy. Uh, they have been running since the mid nineties. 
Uh, and then later on, they have uh, the ICCS, which is the study that we're going to use today, but they have some other, many more actually. They have uh, other studies to assess uh, uh, mathematics teachers or computer literacy, uh, early education, and, and some others. This is uh, very interesting. If you go to their website, you will see all what they have. From the IEA, we, we can say that one of the, as a spin off, uh, PISA was uh, born. And PISA is a study that combines both mathematics, science, reading, literacy in the same test. Uh, uh, but uh, they, they, they have a main subject in each cycle every three years. So it is rotating. And then after PISA, which started in 2000, the other studies were, were launched. For example, PIAC, which is also known as the PISA for adults is another study, an important study uh, done by the OECD. And they have TALIS, which is a Teaching and Learning International Survey. This is a survey for teachers, also very, very large uh, uh, study. More or less uh, at the same time, but uh, derived from, from these two organizations, these are probably the two main organizations doing global studies. Uh, what happened is that some countries have started to question whether it makes sense to compare countries that are very, very different, let's say Peru and Sweden, or Nigeria and uh, Thailand. Uh, and, and they started to question whether it makes sense, whether we can learn anything from countries that are so diverse. And with this idea in mind, uh, UNESCO was the first one to start uh, sponsoring or encouraging uh, some regional studies, international but regional studies. So the oldest one is uh, Terce, which actually started uh, at the same time as PISA. Uh, and this Terce is a regional study, a regional comparative and explanatory study for Latin American countries. And they thought that it makes sense to compare uh, countries in the same region because, for example, in Latin America, they speak the same language. They uh, have a similar uh, history. They have a similar education system. They have a similar economic development, similar culture. So it made sense to have a, a study that is especially designed for them. And they have been doing it uh, since then. No? Terce is the third study, but now actually I should have uh, written ERSE because this is the, they are now about to release the data for, for the fourth study, in which, by the way, uh, Diego Carrasco is, is uh, working on. Uh, well, we have this study, but they also have other regional studies like SACMEC, which is the Southern and Eastern Africa Consortium for monitoring education, educational quality. And then other international organizations came into play like the World Bank supporting PASEC, which is, uh, is, is basically a, a regional study in Africa for French speaking countries or PRIDI, which is a study in Central America for uh, early childhood education. Uh, now, more recently, UNICEF has also come into play with some regional studies, one in the Southeast Asia. Uh, uh, it's, it's called the Southeast Asia Primary Learning Metrics. And they also have PILNA, which is the Pacific Islands Literacy and Numeracy uh, Assessment. For those interested in uh, academic tourism, this is your study. So you can travel to all these nice islands in the Pacific. Uh, what else? What do these ILSAs evaluate? Of course, at the beginning, it was only mathematics, reading, and science. But as they have uh, evolved, they are now evaluating many different things. We have, uh, as you know, mathematics, reading, and, and science. These are the, the main things, the, the first things that were started to evaluate. But then we also have some studies like the Saudi, the study in Southeast Asia and ERSE. They evaluate writing to not only reading, but writing literacy. The, the study that we're going to use today for the examples uh, uses information about civic education, but also about attitudes and beliefs towards different things, no? like uh, attitudes and beliefs toward equal rights for immigrants, for men and women, for um, ethnic rights, ethnic minorities, etc. PISA has also been, uh, let's say, playing around or evaluating other areas like financial literacy, or in, and in the most recent edition, global competences. Uh, as I already told you, there are some other studies in the IEA, for example, evaluating computer literacy, 
and there are more things you know, that you can uh, you can uh, explore. Apart from evaluating this, these are the things that they evaluate. The, 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 what is the test about? But apart from that, all these studies collect a, a wealth of uh, background information. So they, they evaluate uh, learning outcomes, but also they evaluate the context in which learning happens. They collect, in most cases, uh, information from uh, students and their families in some cases. They collect information from teachers, they collect information from schools or school principals, and they also compile information about uh, countries. So when the students, for example, do, they, they collect uh, uh, data like sex, uh, age, grade, uh, whether they belong to an ethnic group, uh, what is their immigration background, socioeconomic status. Uh, in the case of teachers, is also sociodemographic information, but also they collect information about professional development needs and, uh, and, what, what, and what kind of professional development they are receiving too, teaching practices, teaching beliefs. Uh, in the case of principals, they collect information about the principal, him or herself, sociodemographic information, but also about the things that happen in the school, like school climate, bullying, uh, parental engagement, etc. And about the countries, uh, I mean, th this information is, is not really collected by the survey, but it's, it's easily, uh, uh, can be easily merged with this information. No? And they don't collect it because it's only one variable per country. No? In general, it wouldn't make much sense. But if you want to do this kind of analysis, it is possible. And, and most or many researchers do include uh, variables like GDP, uh, Gini, or HDI, Human Development Index, uh, level or state of democracy, cultural indicators, happiness, and, and you name it. Hmm? In general, on average, each of those studies that I was telling you about collect around 700 uh, background variables. So pretty much anything that you need to know about the context in which learning happens, it's going to be there. So you just, have, you just have to look for look at the frameworks, look at the data set, and you will have really a wealth of information that you can use to produce uh, different hypotheses or to test different uh, educational, sociological, political hypotheses. Uh, if you want to have a good overview of uh, all international large scale assessments, there is a web website that is sponsored by the IEA but includes international assessments even the ones that are not uh, run by the IEA. So uh, most of the, actually all of the studies that I told you about, they are included here. And they, they give you, um, in one place, they put all the information that you need. Uh, for example, the data set. Each study has a different way to get the data set. Sometimes you can just go click in a link and download it, but sometimes you have to request access to the data set. Uh, but well, in this, uh, and sometimes it's not so evident or so easy to, to find the link to actually get the data. But this website is going to help you to do that. It's also going to give you facts about the studies, who is organizing, what is the sample, what countries participate, um, et cetera, et cetera. And what are they evaluating, what uh, background information is available, uh, and, and many more things. Now you can access all the international reports from all the studies from this website. It's going to tell, give you information about the organizations that are running the studies, uh, additional materials, and even papers that are published in uh, peer-reviewed journals using the different data sets. So it's, it's a very uh, good starting point if you are interested in this area. Now, very quickly about the, the study that we're going to use today. It's called the International Civic and Citizenship Education Study. Uh, and this is a, an old... Uh, Sorry, one of the first ones. It actually, the first, uh, is, is the first study that was run by the IEA in the 70s, in only 10 countries, included a, a test on civic education. Later on in 99, there was the first CIVET, civic education study, in which 28 countries participated. In 29, we had 38 countries. 2016, which is the data that we have available and the one that we are going to use today, has 24 countries. And they are now recruiting countries. They, are, they have started the process. Actually, they, they, they should be collecting data sometime soon, in 2022, next year, 
uh, is going to be the, the next uh, ICCS. We don't know yet how many countries we are, we are going to have there. Uh, something that is a very interesting and very characteristic of this study is the um, regional components. So as I said, uh, one of the criticisms to these global studies is that it's very difficult to compare across countries that are very different. But in this case, the, the ICCS has blocks of countries uh, which have a, a component in the, in the, in the instruments. That are, that those are questions that are exclusively made to students in Europe, for example. And those are questions that have to do with the problematics, the, the, the context of Europe, but also in Asia and Latin America. We have very interesting things in these regional models. In, in Europe, uh, I think we have uh, one of the issues that was um, uh, prominent was immigration. Uh, in Latin America, we have issues about democracy, uh, about corruption, about di different things that the, the countries, the representatives of the countries from the different uh, regions thought it was uh, relevant or important to include in the tests. So they have this flexibility and they also have these regional reports uh, based on this uh, uh, specific data for each region. The objective in general is to compare the civic and citizenship education uh, in the different education systems. Uh, and also they, they want to measure trends from CIVET 99, which is a, technically is the, the one that is comparable with 2009, 2016, and will be comparable with uh, uh, ICCS 2022. Um, and also the idea is also to address new challenges in civic and citizenship education. If you observe uh, the frameworks of the studies, the different studies, the different cycles, you will see that they are or they try to adapt to, to new challenges that we are facing uh, in, in society. And another important thing to say is that they have uh, two main domains. One that is cognitive and the cognitive part is the test. And this is about, uh, this is uh, evaluating the knowledge and understanding of concepts uh, of the uh, civi uh, ci civic and citizenship concepts of the different countries. And uh, probably more, uh, well, from my personal perspective, probably more interesting or very, very interesting is the affective domain, which uh, is, is uh, developed around beliefs, attitudes and behaviors or intended behaviors that have to do with civic participation, with citizen, citizenship participation. Uh, and this is a, a, well, very interesting to, to contextualize the, the, the knowledge and contextualize what is happening in, in the different countries in terms of uh, civic and citizenship education. Yeah, the, the documentation, you can have links in the, in the presentation or in the ILSA gateway, which is the website where I told you you can have information from all studies. Uh, most of these studies specifically ICCS, but most of them have a framework. So. What, is, uh, what are the concepts in, uh, based on which the assessment was built? Why do they, quest, uh, why do they ask what they ask? And why do they have this information in the background questionnaires? How is it expected that the information that is collected in the background questionnaires is somehow related or why should it be related with the cognitive part, for example, or the relationship among the different components of the background questionnaire? They also have international uh, reports and regional reports. A technical report that is gonna give you all the details that you want about the different stages. How was the sampling done? How was the assessment designed? How, was the, how were the scores scaled? Uh, how are the background um, constructs, the, the scales, the background scales uh, produced? Everything uh, that you can think of is going to be there. How, how do they construct the sampling weights? How do they construct the replicate weights? Everything is there. It's, a, it's like a brick, it's like 700 pages of uh, pure fun. Uh, and you also have a, a user guide, a user guide uh, that is going to tell you how to use the data set. Where can you download it? How can you analyze it? The, the IEA has a, a software that is uh, very useful to do some very basic analysis descriptive analysis and up to regressions and logistic regressions you can do with that software. And the user guide has a full chapter on 
where can you get this software, which is free in principle, but you need SPSS or SAS to run it and how to use it. So it's, it's, uh, it's very useful as well. And uh, they have the database, they have uh, infographics, and they have in general, all the information that you will need. Uh, I, I didn't tell you, but I, I used to work for the IEA. Uh, one of the things that I was uh, doing is answer questions from people who had questions about how to analyze the data. And uh, I can say like 98% of the responses was where go to the user guide in the page 458 and there is there is your answer. So any practically any questions that you may have, it's already in this uh, user guide. Of course, you're not expected to read it from beginning to the end, but if you download the PDF, which is free and publicly available, uh, you can easily find answers to, to your questions or doubts that you may have. Finally, something that is uh, important to say, and this is probably why we have this, this workshop, I mean, structural equation model latent class analysis are not the, the, the newest statistical techniques, but they become complex when the data that you want to analyze is complex too. Why you will hear a lot that the data from international large scale assessments is complex. And when they say that, what they mean is that it, they have a complex sample design and they also have a complex assessment design. When we say complex sample design, what we mean is that the sampling strategy is multi-stage stratified cluster. Uh, it is multi-stage stratified cluster sample design, which basically means that it's not a random, a simple random sample. It's not that you have the names of all the students, put them in a hat and select 5,000. What you actually do is to select first a sample of schools uh, previously stratified and then within the schools that you selected you select a sample of uh, in this case of classes and then you take all the students that are in a selected class uh, that in, in practice has a consequence uh, and the consequence is that you have to use sampling weights uh, to, to balance the, the sample and the population but also because of the multi-stage stratified design, you have to account for that. And you do that by using uh, multi-level models or hierarchical linear models or, uh, or and or replicate weights. Replicate weights being the, the same as uh, any, it's, it's a form of uh, resampling method or bootstrapping, many people know it like that. The, the method that they use in the IEA or that they provide uh, tools for is uh, replicate ways, jackknife replication to be more specific. So this is for the sample, the complex sample design. For the complex assessment design, what they mean is that not every student is assessed uh, and not every item is answered by every student that is chosen. So you have a sample of students, which we already said, but then you have a sample of items which means when you want to analyze, to, when, you, when you want to evaluate civic knowledge, the test would be so long that a one single student would take around 12 hours to answer the test nonstop. Because you cannot do that. What you do instead is that you take a sample of the items, a part of the test, and give it to one student, another part of the test to another student, and so on and so forth. So among a group of students, they answer the full test. But then what happens is that you have a, missing data for every student. Every student has missing data and you have to impute this data. This is known as the plausible values, which in practice is nothing more than having a <coughs> multiply imputed data sets uh, for the cognitive part. But that also has an implication when you want to do the analysis. And, and in both cases, the complex sample design and the complex assessment design, uh, the replicate ways or the plausible values, what happens is that you have to add something else to the calculation of the standard error. So you have a, so you don't underestimate these standard errors. The formula is there, you don't have to learn it, learn it uh, of course, or you don't have to solve it by hand, but uh, the, the software in this case, M plus is gonna take care of it for us. And now I think this is the, the last, uh, a slide. Some things that we have to consider when before we start analyzing data is that this is cross-sectional data. So this is from one specific point in time. Uh, so therefore we cannot, we, we know what the students, what happened, what is the context of uh, learning 
when the assessment was made. We don't know what happened before, we don't know what will happen after, and things may change. So we have to consider that. Uh, we, for, for this reason, it's, it's a very difficult or practically impossible to establish causal relationships. However, we can have a very rich description of what students know and the context in which this in which this learning occurs. As I said, you have 700 variables to describe this context. Um, so uh, yeah, another thing that to consider is that all students, teachers, principals, they report their perceptions and beliefs, which is not necessarily the truth. Uh, so they're gonna say what they think, what they feel uh, is not necessarily the truth because we have things that biases like uh, social desirability, we can have overstatements that are more pronounced depending on, on there are different in different cultures. We have contradictions too. So we have a number of things that we have to, to consider, but th those are uh, limitations that are general for, for any uh, type of uh, study based on a, on a survey. And now this is uh, all from my part. I'm gonna give the floor to, to Diego to continue with the, well, first how to prepare the data and then the first example on latent class analysis. If you have any questions about this, well, there was uh, sharing his screen, please uh, just go ahead. Okay. Give me a second, very to close my window. <laughs> to avoid any other. <laughs> Can you hear me well? Okay. Um, what I'm going to present is how um, is, is to try to address five different problems that we may encounter when we are um, dealing with uh, data from large scale assessment. The, the first one is that we're going to have several files and we want to have them in a single file to make, uh, for example, a uh, data model that compares between countries. And the later problem that we will have uh, after a few other loops that we need to resolve is um, how to export data for, um, um, how to export data when we need to model a, I mean, when we need to fit any other latent model outside the original environment that we are working with. Um, what is um, <clears throat> so for starters, what we can say is that if we uh, picture the, the full set of stages from data collection to uh, presentation of results, we need to start by thinking that we, we any large scale study start by having participants with a certain design, then we're going to have um, a set of a specific instrument with which act as a stimulus to participants so they can um, give us responses. Then we have a data entry process <laughs> in which these responses are record or stored. And finally, we need to use those response files that come from a data entry process and import them in, in a certain way. Um, wait, I'm going to check if my uh, microphone is okay. Okay, yeah, it's okay. Um, so the presentation for um, the, the, the current presentation, what I'll be talking about is once we have the response files that are the public data files that an uh, agency will release, how uh, we cover the process from importing data to uh, exporting um, a prepared data file for uh, implementing a, data uh, a certain statistical model. So we're, we're just going to focus between data importation to the exportation of a prepared data file for a statistical model. So if we try to think about um, this, uh, this stage that we can, 
that I will consider this, this process as, a, as an iterative process. So every time that we work with uh, large scale assessment data, we will take up the original data files till we build up a statistical model. And we're going to be, do this, this several stages, uh, several times. Either this be because we would make a mistake and we need to amend it, or because we are going to do more than one model. It's really difficult to prepare a single data set for every possible statistical <laughs> model. So the most likely scenario is that if we're going to fit, for example, a, an IRT model or a latent class analysis or a, a structural equation model, is that we will need to prepare data for each of those uh, statistical models. So if we think uh, uh, this iterative process as a set of problems, I would say that the, uh, I mean, a selection of the most common problems between importing to um, exporting data will be first, how to deal with the fact that we will have several files. This varies between, uh, between different studies. Some studies, they will give you uh, um, uh, an already merged file. So there, in, in a single file, you will receive all the responses out of the students for the, for the text, for example. And we would only need to merge those files with the school data. In the case of ICCS, this is not the case. What they give you is 24 files uh, for the questionnaire, uh, for the background questionnaire for students. And so you're, you're receiving one file per country per instrument. So for example, if, if the study has, uh, is collecting data from teachers, then you would have an instrument uh, an informant and then a country. <laughs> then you can multiply how many files can you uh, are you going to receive. In the case of ICCS 2016, I think it's about like 139 uh, in total. The second problem is that once we have uh, once we, we we created like a uh, um, like a merge file, so a single object in which we are collecting all the responses out of the students from from all the countries from a single study is how can we build up um, like a friendly document? So how can we know what is, what is within the file that we have created? So we're going to address that uh, with a few lines of code. Then the third problem is how to deal with um, the survey design. What, everything about th that Andres was telling you about before regarding that um, there was the, the students that, that participate in the study come from a complex sample design that means that we're going to have several vectors within the data frame. That means several variables that express this complex sample design. When, when, in, when we are in the scenario that we want to compare, for example, two countries at the same times in a single model, that means that the, to take advantage of the, the survey design, we, we need to make some sort of tweaks. Either this be that we need to scale up the survey weights or to be sure that the stratification variables are in, in a correct manner. Because not all the statistical software would assume in a, in, in, in a correct way the, the expected properties of these, uh, these variables. Then um, one of the most common problems, uh, what I would say the fourth problem in this uh, framework is to consider the, um, the response interpretation. That means that most of the time when you have um, um, a paper-based studies, the data entry values over the responses of the students are assigned from left to right. And so that means that not always, like a higher value would mean like a higher frequency, like a higher endorsement or like a higher agreement. So we may need to change those values into uh, values that are interpretable for our purposes. And finally, the fifth problem <laughs> to finalize this, this, um, this workflow is the transferability of the data frame that we can create. So how easy is that we can share the data frame that we created either to uh, another user that we are going to uh, collaborate with or for ourselves in the future. <laughs> so the main point is that once we have done all this work, how friendly and how easy it is to transfer all the work that we have done so we can make use out of it uh, in, um, in an easy way.
to illustrate this, uh, how to address these different problems, we're going to use R. In particular, we're going to mainly use libraries from the tidyverse. So these are like friendlier uh, libraries and comments. And um, as, a, as a complement, we're going to use um, an experimental library that uh, I'm developing that uh, resolves many of the issues that you would need to do to, for example, to scale up uh, survey weights. And I mean, one of the advantages of using this experimental library is that all the specialized uh, functions are fully documented. So for example, one of the most, um, I would say like odd <laughs> code is how to scale survey weights for multi-level models. If you go to the repository of, of this library, you can open up the code that I'm using and you can even uh, find the reference from which I'm taking on how to build up these uh, scales. And um, uh, a warning that I can give you is that the, the way that I'm, that, I'm, that I'm building up this, for, uh, this workflow is an entirely opinionated uh, analysis. That means that this is not the only way to do it. This is just a way to do it. And uh, I, I can argue that this is a reasonable way to do it. But at the same time, this means that you can find different ways that would suit your, your needs and purposes probably in a, in, a, in a better way. So the first problem is that we're going to address is, is how to import many files. If you go uh, through the standard way of um, the trainings that the IEA provides, you will need to use IDB Analyzer. What IDB Analyzer does is that it's going to read your computer. And if you have uh, SPSS installed, it's going to create several macros that would allow you to merge all the data files from different countries. So the issue is like, what happens if you don't have SPSS? Or what happens if you don't want to have it? <laughs> um, then one alternative is to use uh, an open source uh, and, and, and a freely available uh, statistical software like R. And what, what, what we need to resolve is how to do this in, um, in a tidy manner, how to do it in a friendly way. Um, because the, the other option would be to write uh, a single line of code for each of the files and then merge them all together and Probably that would be a little bit tedious, and at the same time, it's going to be cumbersome and prone to error. So one way to try to address this problem is that what we need is, is, a, is a function that, is, that can be repeated over our list. So the, the following code that is at the right side of the, of the, the, of the handout, first, what is establishing is, is an object that says where you have the data files located. Then in a second step, it's going to go to that, uh, to that location and it's going to search for all the files that uh, fit this, the following pattern, the ISG. As um, Andres was saying, most of the information from ICCS is contained in the technical documents. And if you go to the technical documents, I think it's in page 24, they say what are the common features between the data files that they provide for the study. So all the files that contain the responses of the students from the background questionnaire, they start with the, with the letters ISG. So out of the 139 files, we know that these are the only files that, um, that are collecting and storing the responses of the students to the background questionnaire. Once we have this object, which is just a list of all the locations of these 24 files, what we need to have is something that can import all of those files one by one and then give us a, a, single, a single object. And this can be done by the following, the following code. And so this is a functional um, uh, coding. And what it's doing is that these are, these are the lines that can read a single SPSS file that is located in some, uh, in some logical uh, folder within your computer. And what this function is doing is that it's reading one by one all the 24 locations, then applying the, um, 
the, the Haven uh, function to read SPSS files. And then at the end, because this is a DF uh, function, instead of giving you a list, it's going to give you a full data frame in, in, in a single line. So we have just resolved the first problem that if we have many files, there are ways that we can work around with code to uh, uh, avoid this idea of uh, importing files one by one. The second issue is that now we, we already have the, a single data frame in which every, uh, all the responses from the student background questionnaire are contained. But now the issue is how can we uh, create a, um, like, a, an, like an informative file? One way to do an informative file was uh, an easier to, to open file. <laughs> That means that we, if, if we send it, for example, out of an email or we, if we share uh, via Dropbox to another user, it is that this file that we're providing uh, can be read by any other user. And one solution is to create a simple code book. A simple code book is just going to contain, for example, the list of variables, the, kind of, the type of variables that the data frame contains and uh, like a short description. When we create a, a, a data frame, for example, with either with SPSS, Stata, SAS, or any other statistical package, if they, there is no guarantee that any other user could open those files unless they have those statistical package installed in their computers. Um, so even if we, for example, are, are um, I don't know, like a frequent user of R, that means that every time that we want to see the content of a data file, we will need to open up R and create a code to just to check what is in, inside of this data frame. So uh, I would say like a good practice uh, recommendation um, every time that we're working with large scale assessments that every time that we are going to import the original data from our large scale assessment, um, and we are going to save this, these merged files, we could uh, create like a simple code book that accompany these files. So every time that we are sharing these kind of folders that contain these uh, data frames, you can easily open it up, for example, um, uh, an, an Excel spreadsheet that give you like a quick description of the, uh, of the, um, of the information that is containing the, the merge file that, that we created. So an easy way to just to uh, create like a code book uh, is to use the the, um, the the experimental library that I'm that I'm developing, and we repeat the same um, object that we created before. That is, we're just telling our where's where our files are located, and we're going to use use these following lines of code. Uh, the variable stable function, what it does is it's going to read the, the data frame and it's going to extract the, um, the descriptive information out of the content of the data frame. So it's going to retrieve the, the variable names, the, it's going to create like a single column of type, it's going to extract also like a sample of values that you can see, and the labels that you would, uh, that you would see, for example, in this kind of policy, if, if you open them up in SPSS or Stata. Um, and then we're just going to use another, another library that is open X, uh, X, LX, X, <laughs> which is, is, a, is a library to open and create Excel files. And we're going to store this table uh, within the same folder in which we are going to save the, the merge files of all the responses of the students to the background questionnaires for every country. <laughs> this is a little bit more cumbersome. And this idea of having common names for uh, survey design variables is uh, under the assumption that you may need to work with different um, uh, large scale studies. So the, the SNR for which we were working to, um, that we were working on and that we came up with this solution was in a scenario that we, uh, I don't know, let's say on Monday, I was, uh, we were needed to be working with PISA, on Tuesday I would be needed to work with, working with ICCS, and then on Wednesday we will be needed to work with uh, Teams. 
And this was this was a, a real scenario that we were working with uh, Andres, in which we were uh, making several comparisons between countries over different uh, indicators for the SDG um, um, indicators comparison uh, initiative from UNESCO. So the issue is that most of this, the large scale studies would have a collection of clustering variables uh, that express the survey design. The, the idea here is that most of these objects are common, but they will have a specific names for different, uh, for different studies. So for example, the total survey weight in PISA doesn't have the same name that would have the total survey weight in ICCS. So if we are going to constantly uh, analyzing data from PISA and from ICS, ICSS uh, back and forth, um, one way to address this issue or to deal with this scenario is to have a common name for all the main objects of the survey, the survey design. If we do this, the, the advantage of having a, a workflow that uh, uses this strategy uh, is that it allows us to create transferable code that is applicable either to ICCS, to PISA, to TALIS, or to any other large scale assessment that shares the same features. So uh, what we are calling clustering variables are just the, the unique um, variables that identify an observation. So for example, a student is within a classroom and that classroom is within a school and that school is within a strata. And uh, because uh, most of the ICCS, I mean, most of the IEA um, studies uses jackknives, a part of, of, of clustering variables, they would have a replicate uh, unit or um, like a primary sampling unit. The primary sampling unit is, uh, is, the, is the clustering variable that is collect, that is uh, joining together a several set of, of observations that are going to be corrected in a certain way uh, using the, the survey design. In, in actual terms, what it happens with a few countries that don't have enough cases within a school is that they would need to merge them together in a pseudo school. So at the end, in, when you're working with the estimation with a jackknife, uh, these pseudo schools are uh, hidden between the jack zones and the jackknife replicated weights. So using the information from the jack zones and from the um, replicate weights, you can create these primary sampling units, which are the cluster that the jackknife is using to correct the standard errors. And this is mainly applicable for countries that are too small, for example, this is the case of Luxembourg, but this wouldn't happen uh, for larger countries such as Mexico, in which you have like many, many, many schools. Um, the second collection of, of, uh, of variables uh, within the survey design that we need to treat are the survey weights. Most of the studies from large scale assessment, what they would give you, or, or that will be more obvious to, to identify or to spot is the total weight. So the total weight is the um, vector of variables that we can use to expand the observations that we have to make inferences to, to the population. But the scale of this variable is going to be in the expected population of the design. So given the sampling frame, let's say, I don't know, a country has an expectation of, or, or a population of uh, 5,000 schools. So that means that the total weight is going to expand the selected observations to those 5,000. So if in comparison, we have another country that has, I don't know, 80,000 schools, that means that the survey weight is going to be a scale to expand the observation to that total number. Um, the other weights that we might need for, uh, for modeling are the within school weights and the school weights. Uh, so this is, for, uh, this is especially the case for um, multi-level modeling using pseudo maximum livelihood in which we um, estimate a random term that will represent the, um, the Latin mean of the schools, but at the same time, we want to include in the estimations the survey design. So that means that the probability of selection of the schools are going to be uh, conditioning where are we going to locate the Latin means that we are uh, trying to fit with a multi-level model. 
So if we want to uh, create those kind of models, we will need then to build up the student weights within the schools and the school weights. In the case of ICCS, this is an easy task because you can go to the, uh, the technical report and, and in a specific page, they're going to tell you what are the different um, components of the survey weights that you need to use to build up the within, uh, within school student weights and the between school, uh, school weights. This is not the case, for example, with PISA or with TALIS, in which you might need to retrieve the school weights from another data file. Um, so bear in mind that the, the generation of the within and the between school weights, uh, they heavily require that you have like a thorough um, reading or revision of the technical, uh, the technical documentation out of the, lar uh, the lar large scale assessment that you're, that you're working with. Finally, the, the Senate weight, most of the time, this is already provided by uh, the, the public data files, but uh, you might need, um, it's possible that you want to have it in, in a different scale. I think if I'm not mistaken, most of the, the large scale studies, they would give you Senate weights um, that are scaled up to 500, but if you can also scale it to a different number and they may tend to work in, in, a, similar, in a similar fashion. The, the Senate weights are crucial when you want to merge two different countries that they have um, sampling frames of different sizes. So let's say that we want to compare, I don't know, like Paraguay and Mexico, which are like entirely different in size of the amount of the schools that they contain. So if, they put, if we put them together with the same weight uh, and we just run either like a multi-level model or like confirmatory factor analysis or an IRT, our estimates are going to be distorted given that one of the countries have weights that are much, much larger than the, than the, than the other country. So if we scale them up, that means that the sum of the weights are going to be fixed to a, a, a specific number. Then the two countries are going to be balanced and then each of the two are going to be contributing to the, um, to the statistical model in, in, in an equivalent way. And finally, here are uh, the, the generation of the scale weights for multi-level models uh, that can include the survey weights within their estimations. Uh, um, the most common versions of these uh, scale weights are the normalized within school weights and the effective, su uh, effective sample size within school weights. In, in the references of this, pre uh, this presentation is the reference to Stapleton uh, from 2013. Stapleton, Stapleton makes a thorough revision of, uh, of what are the features of these two uh, type of uh, scale weights and when these are uh, more convenient uh, than the other. With larger samples, they tend to behave in a similar way, but there are, there are like age cases in which one of the two may be more convenient than the other one. So this is a, uh, like a few lines to take up the merge that we created before and apply all of those. Uh, uh, we're addressing all of the, the previous issues that I mentioned. So the first one, uh, the first few lines which are these ones, are generating uh, the clustering variables that will have the features that we need if we want to make uh, latent variable models that include more than one country, and at the same time, take advantage of the survey design. Uh, then the following lines are, are there to deal with the um, survey weights. So the first one is just creating a generic, uh, generic name for the total survey weight, and then the other one are creating the raw within school weights and between school weights. Then the next line is just to create um, a Senate weight that is going to be called uh, double S, I mean, double QS. And then the final lines are just there to add the multi-level weights that we will need to use if we want to do um, multi-level modeling, including the survey weights. Um, so for now, in, in the code that, that I'm showing you or that I'm proposing within this framework, um, I'm just giving a solution of how to build up, for example, uh, like a unique ID uh, for, for all the schools across all the countries. 
But the main point that, the, that I'm trying to say within this workflow is that to take advantage of the survey design, we need to be sure that the clustering variables behave in the way that they are intended to. The, the, the main point here is that the original ID school from ICCS, for example, can be repeated between school, I mean, between countries. So that means that let's say in Colombia, there is a school that is called 0001. And then in Netherlands, there is also another school that is called 0001. So if I put Colombia and Netherlands in the same, um, in a same table, and then I submit that table to a common um, multi-level package or, or multi-level library, the, the software may not know that the school 001 from Colombia and the school 001 from Netherlands is a different school. So we need to tell the software that these are two different schools. One way to, 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 to do that is to generate a specific um, ID cluster that we can uh, defend or that we can show that this is different across all the countries. So the following lines that are here are checking those assumptions. So the, sorry, this, for example, this line, what it's doing is to check that our um, stratification variables that we created that are unique across countries are actually unique across countries. If we fail to create a, a stratification variable that, that um, suffices this assumption, then when we're feeding models using the survey design, uh, the results that we're going to get might be a little bit distorted. In the case of the stratification, maybe this don't uh, this might not be so um, so drastic, but the most likely scenarios that we're going to lose uh, statistical power. The main advantage of having more stratification variables is that we're going to reduce the size of the standard error. So sometimes this is something that we need to be careful about. And in the case of the clusters, so is, this is the identification of the primary sampling unit. Here is way much more drastic. If we are uh, trying to create a, a multi-level model and we have the wrong uh, uh, assignment of students to schools, then the Latin means that we're going to create or fit over the data are going to be entirely wrong because we're, we will be merging students from different schools into the same cluster. So um, these are just two functions. Probably the, the most simple one is the, the one that can create standard weights. So here, the main um, advantage of this function is that you can, uh, you can create standard weights over uh, any, any, any type of sum, I mean, data frame. Um, so even if you have a sub sample uh, of, of a large scale study, you can still create these uh, scale up weights. Um, and the only information that you need to do this is, sorry. Is the, is the original weight and the, the vector of the countries that you're going to be, uh, over which you're going to be creating this, this set of weights. For the, the, the generation of the uh, large scale assessment weights for multi-level modeling, the, the amount of arguments that, I'm, that the function is requiring is a little bit more cumbersome because it's, it's requesting all the, the critical clustering variables and all the weighting, uh, the weighting variables uh, for each country. So this is to be sure that if we're going to create uh, four different variables uh, for survey weights for students within schools and between schools, we need this kind of information to, uh, to be sure that the assignment of the um, scale widths that we're generating are the correct ones. Um, and as I told you before, because this is, a, uh, is, is an open library, if you have doubts of, or, or, or you want to check for reference of how uh, these weights are created, you can go and check the, the, the links of the original repository of this function and check all the references of, from where I'm taking um, the, from where I'm taking the information to uh, implement this procedure. But most of the explanations come from uh, a presentation from Sofia Robesquet and most of the documentation that is present in ICCS technical uh, documentation from 
uh, ICCS 2009. So this is, this is an applied example. So the, the idea here is that for the case of the SDG, we needed to classify students uh, regarding their endorsement of um, civil rights. In this case, in, in the CDG, SDG framework is, is, uh, is labeled as freedom of speech, but within the literature, this scale is treated as what is good for democracy. Um, there, there are different authors that have worked with, with these uh, items. And what we were doing is to use these responses to try to classify students regarding an ideal. So we were following the, the work from Quaranta and he used a latent class model over ICCS 2009. And he um, fitted a, a, a five latent class and one of his latent classes was a, a group of students that would uh, identify all the uh, good things for democracy or things that enhances a democratic system. And they would highly also, or, or they entirely would reject all the situations in which there was a threat for democracy. And so here we're just like hiding, uh, hiding in, in white or living in white. What are the ideal responses out of this uh, latent group? And we're going to recode the original responses into this way. So if we, for example, if we created a sum score with the recorded variables, then we would say probably, I don't know, the, the students that are in the high up of the, of the sum score, they're more likely to belong to this latent class that um, Quaranta uh, found in, in the previous study. So the following code is what is going to do is to first to create two um, like short functions to do reassignments of original uh, uh, values to um, a dichotomic uh, a dichotomous option. So originally the values are from one to three, and we're going to assign them in in a specific pattern. For uh, so the first recording function is going to be one zero zero, and the second uh, recording option is going to be zero zero one, and then we're going to apply um, each of these functions of recording to create new variables, and then we're going to save those. And by saving those as a as an specific uh, object, then we can merge them up as many times as we want to with the original uh, data frame. So what we are doing is to create a specific data frame for a specific model that we want to build up at the end of the of the code. And finally, once we have the data that we need, and so in this case, let's say that we just want to create a, a population average model using a, a latent class to replicate the Quaranta's uh, um, studies, but over ICCS uh, 16. We only need the survey design variables. So these are here. And we already have the items or the responses that we want to analyze. So we can just join them. And once we have them joined, we can export them to the statistical uh, modeling software of choice. This could be either a Stata, could be M plus, or could be latent goal. And if we wrap everything up, so we're just using two um, um, Two code files. One is just this file that is called import data that is going to take all the files and create a single object and then the file of preparing data that is going to create the, the merge files and at the same time is going to export the, the data that we need for the statistical model that we want to feed at the end of the exercise. And if you go to the uh, workshop website you can download the uh, the critical files to try to replicate this this entire process, um, and to replicate this entire process, you if I mean if if you have R installed and you follow the instructions of installing the critical libraries, you should be able to just to execute this free, uh, this first um, file and the second file and produce all the results that uh, that I have just showed you as a as an entire workflow. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, 
I just fork your repository, but I cannot find uh, like the folders zero 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 one whatever. I can only see like uh, session three and uh, like uh, air markdown files with the uh, uh, structure of the question models. So no, they should be in the readme file. In, in the readme file, I mean, you don't need okay. to, to, to clone, for example, the repository. If you just go to the readme file, in the readme file, there are specific links to, ah, to each okay. Uh, of the objects. Okay, 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 great. Thank mm -hmm. you. I'm going to see. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is the end of, of the first session. Should I just go right away to the uh, latent class one? Okay. So give me a sec. Okay, so <laughs> now um, in contrast to the previous presentation which was really focused on the coding, the the current one is going to be a little bit more uh, conceptual. Um, but we're going to use as a bridge the same case scenario. So we were working with UNESCO to try to establish a threshold to say if students were more likely or more able to endorse idea features of uh, things that are good for democracy and things that are bad for democracy. Um, and the issue was that the the traditional way to do, or, or, or at least the, the, for the rest of the instruments that we were working with, uh, the partial coding model, model was, was enough. It was enough to just to um, separate the students between the responses and to make an interpretation regarding if they were like closer to the ideal of, of, of the SDG indicator. Whereas with the case of these items from uh, what is good for democracy, it wasn't the case. Um, and given that there was previous uh, previous literature that already used used uh, mixture models, we um, we were tempted to to try out this 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 approach to see if this would would be useful for the purposes that we we had. Um, so for starters, the main issue with uh, is to understand what is a latent class. Latent class is just a different latent variable that has a different shape. So most of the, the, the most common approaches from latent variables, they conceive uh, latent variables as a continuous uh, term. And this includes IRT models, confirmatory factor analysis, and multi-level models. All of those include latent means that has a continuous shape with a, I mean, with a normal shape. Mixture models, what they do is that they try to retrieve random terms, but they do not have uh, um, a normal shape. They would have only locations and some other restrictions. So the most liberal model is the unordered latent class that is trying to retrieve categorical, unobserved categorical groups out of a set of observations. The probably the, the other uh, kind of a statistical approach that, it, that is out there that's kind of similar or, or, or akin to the process that uh, latent classes are trying to resolve are uh, cluster analysis. Uh, but the main difference between latent class models and uh, latent profile analysis is that the latent class and all the mixture models, they have, um, they come from a probability distribution. So that means that you would have, um, that you would have fits, that you can compare models, that you would have residuals, and so on. This is not something that is easily resolved for the case, for example, of uh, k-means uh, distance in cluster analysis, in, in which it's, it's pretty difficult to compare different solutions. Whereas in the case of latent class analysis, you have access, for example, of the information of the uh, like log likelihood of, of the model and different other um, fit indicators so you can compare two different choices by adding more parameters or um, leaving out different parameters. Um, in the big scheme of things, there are more models. So uh, uh, on one end, you can conceive, for example, IRT models or confirmatory factor analysis. And on the other end, you can have uh, latent class models. And in between, there is a, an array of other different models that are going to mix up this, uh, this 
these different choices. Um, we're not going to talk about those, but it's good to know that they are out there because um, once you are within the latent class analysis, it's really difficult to not to think about mixing up or, or instrumenting a, a latent class for a specific purpose. So we're going to uh, discuss at least three applications that I know regarding how to use uh, a latent class for a specific purpose. One of them is the use of, um, of using latent class analysis to express the, um, the theoretical notion of the long survivor. In, in, for example, in, in, a, in, in a student dropout, if you compare the, uh, the life table of a population of students, you would observe that there are many, many students that don't drop out out of the trajectory of entering from primary school to uh, the later stages of secondary school. Those cases that never drop out, so that they fulfill the full trajectory, they, uh, they, they tend to be called long survivors. This comes from the idea of uh, biostatistics, that when you're applying a survival analysis <laughs> over a disease, there might be cases that are immune to the disease, so they are not at risk of dying. So if we apply the same idea of long survivors to students, is the idea that these are the students that will not be at risk of dropping out. What Massin, uh, Catherine Massin did was to use a latent class model to approximate the notion that, uh, that some students may not drop out. The cool idea of this, uh, of this approach is that when you ignore uh, the, for example, the, the students that don't drop out, all the relationship with your covariates are going to be um, underestimated. And if you're, for example, assessing program evaluations regarding how to retain students or how to retain teachers in, in the schools, uh, you, it might be the case that your program evaluation would be underestimated and then you um, may commit some sort of error regarding your recommendations. Um, so the Catherine Massing is using latent class analysis to implement a non-parametric file tree to correct a hazard estimation. So this is one application in which you use a latent class for a specific purpose and to have a substantive interpretation out of your data. So the main point of this example is to say that latent class are not just like something that comes out of uh, the data uh, as, as a as something, I don't know, like a, like, a, like a random property, is that you can use this kind of model to, rep to represent a specific uh, uh, ideas that, that are useful within social science, especially in education. The, the second example is the work from Torres y Rivara and Dayako in which what they did is that they use latent class analysis to approximate proficiency levels. Most of the time when you take up uh, an IRT model that represents a test and you want to say that, uh, I don't know, uh, such and such students are above the benchmark and the other students are below the benchmark, you will need to uh, get together with a, uh, with a set of um, expert judges. And the expert judges, they would need to tell you what is high achievement, what is medium achievement, and what is low achievement. And they would need to, uh, to reach a, um, a consensus regarding this classification of the student responses. And most of the time they would do that even without the, the information of the empirical data. What they propose is to use latent class within, with a really specific uh, constriction in the model to try to find how many levels are tenable given the distribution of responses. So this allows you to say that if it is um, feasible that you would have a continuous score and then you would say, okay, I'm going to classify all my students between five different levels. So they're going to be the, the, the ones that are really, really high, the ones that are kind of in the middle, the ones that are really in the middle, and then two other different classes of, of low achievement. The model that they are using, it, it allows you to test and to assess if having five levels is feasible. And the most likely scenario sometimes is that if you don't have uh, enough reliability to separate students, five levels is, is too much, but three levels is enough. And for the case of the students, for example, I don't know, uh, classifying students between proficiency levels in teams, 
that's not necessarily difficult because you would have many, many items, but it's an entirely different deal when you want to classify, for example, teachers um, regarding their um, professional uh, uh, performance, because you wouldn't have as many items as you would have in an international large scale assessment. And finally is the example of Quaranta um, that uh, he used a latent class analysis and, and an order one to uh, represent the pattern responses of his students and to say what, what kind of, um, how, I mean, how to use a typology to represent how a student thinks about what, uh, what are the ideal features of a democratic system. And this is the example that uh, we're going to talk about. Um, so I would say that in, in, in summary, what are the main uh, or, or three examples in which it is useful to feed a mixture model is, is when the model can provide you information that the other model can't. And this is the case for log survivors, for serial flight models and ceiling effects. Um, especially when you have a categorical like hypothesis uh, so this is good with, with proficiency levels as ordinals uh, um, features, or when you have a typology diagnosis, um, for example, when you're using indicators for uh, classifying diseases. And um, it, there are also, like, especially applicable when you, once you see the results, that this makes sense. The, the most problematic application of a, of a statistical model is that you finish, you see your table, but you're gonna explain anything. <laughs> that would be like a really good test that if that, it might be that even if your model uh, gets like a really good fit, if you cannot say um, a substantive interpretation with the estimates, then I would say that maybe it's not, it's not the right good, I mean, it's not the right tool for the question that you have. So, this is the, the, the question, I mean, this is the, the, the set of items that the students were answering. And the main problem that we have is that we took all of those, we scored them in the direction that we, we needed to. And once we apply a, a partial credit model, the reliability was really, really low. So it was 0 0.78. Uh, um, so even if we could build up an item person map, that would say what the scores that we created, uh, how they match with the response pattern of the students, the eaten person map was telling us is that there is not so much difference. Um, so that means that, that there is not like a qualitative difference between the students that are in the right side of the, of the threshold and the students that are in the left side of the threshold. There are two, um, they're not far apart. It would be two, um, uh, arbitrary to make this distinction to try to say that these are students that are closer to the ideal of the S SDG indicator. So what we did then was to use the, um, the idea that this complex class exists. So that there is a set of students that uh, above all tend to identify correctly, what are the main threats to democratic system and what are the good uh, features for democratic systems. So we recall the, uh, the original responses uh, following this pattern, and then we are reanalyzed the data uh, to see if we can find the similar patterns uh, that Quaranta found in ICCS 2009. Um, then we have two different choices to compare countries. Um, the first model is what is called the uh, structurally homogeneous. In the structurally homogeneous, you allow that the countries can have a direct effect over the latent variable, but not onto the indicators. This assures you that the response pattern per each latent class is common. So when I found, for example, a student from uh, latent class of one in country A, and, and then I found a student from the same latent class in country B, we're talking about the same response pattern. There is a second um, um, approach to, um, to model uh, responses between countries and it's what is called the partially homogeneous model. In this one, you allow that the country not only has an effect on the rate of the latent class, 
that it has an effect of each of the indicators. What we argue uh, with one of my colleagues, Torres, uh, Torres Irigarra, is that this, uh, this approach, instead of it be calling the partially homogeneous model, should be called the country specific model, because, because what it's going to give you is a model that is really specific to the country. That would make you, for example, let's say that you want to, um, I don't know, uh, use a model to identify or classify uh, diabetes. That would mean that if you use this model, the diabetes type from country A would be different from the country B because the model is allowing you to create different patterns. So if we, um, one way to show this difference is to fit the expected responses out of the two models. So in the, in the thicker line, we have the homogeneous model in which the, the expected pattern of responses uh, cannot vary between countries. Uh, in contrast to the partially homogeneous model in which each country can have its specific uh, expected response. Um, so that means for, it's like the, the countries that are closer to the thicker line, they tend to be more similar to the homogeneous model, but there are several countries that they are too far apart. So the issue is that once we, we generate the latent classes to make inferences, we cannot say the same thing for country A and country B. And the same thing happens with the uh, Latin class, the minimalist. So the minimalists are the, the students that when they were asked, what are the, the, the ideal features of democracy? The majority of them, they would support that uh, electing political leaders and supporting same rights for all are the main features. Whereas the rest of the features, they, this kind of student wouldn't present like a high endorsement. And finally, the really limited students that they tend to not to endorse any of these uh, ideal features of a democratic system. In if this is more or less the, the, the response distribution for the homogeneous model for the 24 countries. And what we end up um, arguing for, for the work that we were doing with UNESCO is that the complex class are the students that are closer to the ideal of the sustainable development, developmental goal. Whereas the other two um, uh, types of students, they do not fulfill um, the idea of um, endorsement or, or identifying the ideal features of a democratic system. So this is just an example of how these models can be fit and specify in two different software. One of them is latent goal. So the first part is the settings that you may need, that, that you could use to include the um, survey weights within the estimation. And then in the second uh, window is the structural part. So the main issue here is that the equations from latent goal express the, the latent diagram in a really direct way. So what we are saying is that we have a latent variable called class and it has three groups. And only this latent variable conditions each of the items. This one there is just to express that you're going to have an intercept within the, uh, the equation and that countries can only uh, predict the rates of, of the class. So the country doesn't have an effect of over the, the items in a direct way. It has an effect over the, the, the items, but only in an indirect way through the latent class. If we want to do the same model or partially the same model with M plus, M plus uses a different parameterization. What M plus does is that you could use a um, so you can turn the, or you can conceive the country as a, as a latent group, but as an observed latent group. And what it's doing is to feed a multi-group latent class analysis. You would retrieve the same expected responses that you can get from latent goal, but you would have more parameters in the approach that M plus is using. And so in this section is where we are putting the information to include the, the, the survey design. And in this other section, we need, in, we need to declare that the items uh, that we're going to estimate and a specific intercept item per class, per group. 
So if you have 24 groups and you have three, uh, three latent classes, that means that you need to write one of these for each group. So you will have as many, many uh, lines such as this one uh, for each uh, country that you're including in your analysis. Um, one of the main issues with latent class analysis is that you need to build up an argument of why you came to the conclusion that this solution is the best one among any, any other alternative. And this is the problem of model selection. Uh, there are many uh, judgments that you can do, uh, but uh, most of the, the implementation uh, requires that you would fit uh, the alternative models that may compete with the solution that you are that, that, you're, that you're choosing. So in our case, we uh, fitted um, um, different models from one to ten latent classes, and then we compare the uh, fit indexes out of these uh, different model choices. The, the main feature that uh, lead us to select the three latent class is that the overall fit uh, was good enough to represent the response pattern of, of the model. So we have a non-significant p-value, which means that the, um, this is applying a chi-square over the, um, the full pattern of responses. It's like a really big table, uh, contingency table. And what this is telling us is that the specified model that we are using is enough to reproduce the contingency table that, uh, that we are applying. Um, so we end up saying, okay, this seems like a, enough statistical evidence to defend the three choice. If we compare with the two, uh, with only the two latent classes or with the four latent classes, you get, in, in the case of the, of, of the two latent classes, you lose a lot of information. In the case of four latent classes, you only retrieve like a really small latent class that seems receivable and that is pretty similar to, uh, to one of the previous ones. So you're not getting much more information. And the main point for, for our purposes is that we wanted to identify, um, I mean, we wanted to have a receivable method to retrieve the complex, uh, the complex profile of the students. We didn't have a substantive um, uh, interest regarding the rest of the latent classes. Um, so for our purposes, the three latent class models uh, seems to be enough and defendable for the uh, task that we, we were trying to, to do. So a few final remarks for the people that may want to use uh, latent class models over <laughs> um, <clears throat> large scale assessment. Um, latent goal is really quick. I would recommend to you that you would use it if, if you have it on hand. N plus is really slow, but it has an advantage over uh, latent goal is that you can um, create code that uses R to fit many, many models and to retrieve the results um, using code in a, I mean, in another way. So you don't have to be copying and pasting estimates from, from tables. Um, the new versions of, of M+, they, they have optimized the, the timing of the estimation for latent classes, but you may need to fiddle around with the options um, to get uh, the, I mean, to get the advantage of this, of, of this speeding process. Um, but in any case, if, I mean, if, it, if it's not um, an effort for you to get a, a hold on latent gold, this is the safest bet. Uh, it's really, really quick. It's about, I don't know, like five minutes per model. Whereas in the case of M plus, it could be like six hours to 70, 70 hours, I mean, to 27 hours or more. And at the end of the, 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 the presentation, I'm including a selection of annotated references so you can uh, consult further, more information regarding these kind of models. Okay, it's my turn. Can you hear me? well sorry yes i have a question about uh, should i wait to the end or about latin class uh, pr probably now is better no yeah i yeah. think so 
Yeah, uh, because I was, I, I have a concern, a personal concern, uh, because um, regarding the multi-group um, analysis in Latin class, uh, if there is uh, a, an order to test the homogeneity, uh, first starting with the homogeneous model and then the partial, um, because I'm having a problem that my the best likelihood is not replicated, and I don't know if that is uh, is related to the, to this. I don't know if yeah. you can help me with this. Yeah, I mean, if if the the log likelihood is not being replicated, that means that um, it's like not having a proper solution. It's like you mm -hmm. you would have uh, more than one solution to the model that you're feeding over your data. So this is like a really big threat for the structure that you're trying to compare with the observed data. Um, if this is the issue, uh, I would try to discard all the other sources that could explain why you cannot find, um, uh, I mean, to, uh, because you need to find like a local maximum. If you yeah. have more than one, then the model doesn't, doesn't know where to stop. <laughs> So one way is to check if you have uh, a sparsity. A sparsity is when you have um, a few cells that doesn't have an, uh, enough information. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so you may need to discard that a few of the categories of responses are available for each of the countries. If this is not the case, I would recommend just to collapse a few of the response categories. Uh, as long as you can still make a substantive interpretation of the uh, re recategorized data. Um, the other option might be to change the algorithm, but that could be more cumbersome. Um, let's say that you can, I mean, that the, the main point of the argument is not regarding the survey design. So if you leave the survey design on the side, <laughs> because maybe it's not the main point of the of the of the inquiry, you may have um, different choices of estimators, and one of them is uh, a non-informative Bayesian model, and that may help in terms of speed, and may also help in terms of um, the non-replication of the best log likelihood. Those are the two yeah. at least uh, choices that I would try to do. Okay, but uh, it does it is not related in any way with the uh, multi-group analysis because it happens mm -hmm. when I perform that. Mm -hmm. Am I in? <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't understand your question. Then. Sorry. No, I, I'm just asking if it's not related with the multi-group analysis, like uh, if the constraint of some parameters maybe are um, complicating the oh, analysis. That... I mean, I would say that the main, I mean, my first suspicions would be that if uh, is, is a sparsity, uh, I mean, is a sparsity conditioned by uh, several groups. Because for example, let's say that you have uh, 10 countries, each of the 10 countries is going to provide you 5,000 cases. The most likely scenario is that you would have observations in any of the cells of the, con the contingency table. But if you separate all the countries <laughs> and you feed the same model repeatedly over the, the 10 countries at the same time, I would bet money that you may have some sparsity in at least one of them in one of the categories. Okay. So that's why most of the examples of latent class, what they do first is to do some sort of uh, recategorization of the variables. So they would start with an original set of, of, of responses that may have, I don't know, categories from one to four, mm -hmm. but when they feed the model, they do it over a uh, recategorized um, response data of only two categories. And this is a way to avoid the, the sparsity. Yeah, now I'm working already with binary, binary data, so I don't, I don't think that is the issue. Okay. Yeah, but- um, this, These are the only two <laughs> options that I can think of for now. <laughs> yeah, I will check it again. Thank you. Okay. And um, I, I, I have a doubt about, about the time, how much time I have in, in order to, because I, I worry about the, the, the finish of, of the session. 
We have until 7.30. Yes. Okay, okay. So we have half an hour. Very good. Yeah, I, I, yeah. thanks again for the invitation to Impulsi uh, conference. I'm, I'm pretty happy, very happy to, to participate uh, in, in this year. Uh, I prepared a presentation about the structural equation modeling. Uh, let me check. Yeah. This is a presentation that have three uh, uh, moments. The first moment is a very brief theoretical foundation about the, the, the structural equation modeling and, and its applications. I, I will try to go in fast in this part because in, in order to go into to the examples uh, in, the, in the second and third part, uh, I prepare an, an example estimation of confirmatory factor analysis. And in the second part, using the same scales that I use in confirmatory factor analysis, I use an structural equation modeling in order to predict this, this uh, latent variables that, that I estimated in the, in the, in the first part of, of the example. Um, okay, ab ab about the, the general uh, issues about the structural equation modeling. Uh, it's very important to discuss this, this issue about, and, and the most important application of, of the, the SEM, SEM, is about the measurement issues in social, in social science. The most part of concept uh, uh, attributes or controls, controls that we have and we can observe in the, in the social science uh, is, are latent and, and it's very difficult to observe in, in, in the real life. Typically we observe in a manifest ways uh, using indicators, that, that is the, the logic that we use in the, in the most part of service. When we ask to people uh, that answer uh, some items, we are trying to observe some specific behavior that is an indicator of a latent uh, issue, a latent, a latent concept. And in that way, we, we try to, and, and we need to construct better measures uh, with less error. And if we have better measure with less error, we have better instruments. That, that is the main approach that I, that I use and, and we can read in, in different texts about the application of structural equation modeling uh, in social science. And that is the, the most important logic that we will use in, in here. And how to diminish the, the, the measurement error. Uh, more part of time, we, we have to deal with the, with the error because we have a lot of sources of error. And that, that is the most important uh, or the most uh, trend to the, to the measure that we use and the models that we that we made. Uh, this is the approach about the, the total error um, in which we can observe, for example, we have two main sources, sources of error, the representation, and in which, for example, ILSAS, the, the large kill assessment studies, try to uh, control it uh, using, for example, very good samples, samples in the in the in the different countries. But there is a lot of problem in, in with that because this, the difference in, in countries have a lot of problems and huge variation across countries about, about the how how good is, is the sample, about the target population, for example, the clarity about that, the the possibility to, to define the, the population inference, uh, the sample frames. It's very, very different across countries. For example, Latin America, we have a lot of problems about the country frames. And after that, when we go to the schools, sometimes sometimes the schools there's not exist, or the student doesn't exist in, in certain schools, or the or the the number of uh, students change uh, from when we create the sample frame and after that. And when we collect the sample, there is a lot of problem all the time because some student doesn't exist and and the absence uh, impact on the on the sample that we collect in the in the final part, and the respondent uh, have a different approach to the to the questionnaire, and in that case we have a lot of different moments in where we increase and and uh, uh, increment uh, the, the the measurement error about the representation issue, and in instance we can observe that uh, it's not the same. For example, when, when we observe the typical. Uh, social service in, in where they, they take care about the representation, but they take care less about the measurement. 
And in the measurement uh, track, we can observe another different uh, sources of errors. For example, in here, about the measurement, we can define properly the construct. That is the most important thing, I think, uh, because if we, we can make a very good definition about the construct, the latent construct, we can make a very good content in the operationalization. We can uh, create very good items. We can select the, the items that will represent these latent uh, measures. But we don't know. In, in no, the efforts are not enough, I think, in, in here, because the measures all time have problems. Uh, in this in this relation between the operation and, and operationalization and the construct. For example, when we use ILSAS, we have only some set of items in order to represent a construct. And sometimes this set of items is very limited in order to represent our, con our construct. And in that case, we have to deal with that. But we have the same sorts of errors about the measures that we will use. And after that is the measurement in, in, in the response, depending on the, of the field that we use and, and decide. And if we use as, as a continuous variable, as a categorical variable, as a binary variable, in, in all cases, we made decisions that could impact on the measurement error about the, about the country. And after the response is the same because students and the process of the information they have a lot of variation over countries, for example. And in that case, we, have, we will have a, a lot of uh, or difference across countries about the processing error. And in that case, yet yeah, this, this uh, uh, figure is, in, is only to discuss about the, the different sources of threat in order to make our estimations. And in that case, we, we we can use the different techniques that are available in order to deal with it. And the structural equation modeling is, is one, uh, one tool or set of tools in order to, to deal and try to um, decrease the sources of error and try to model uh, statistically the, our data. And as I said, uh, the latent variable is not directly observed, it's just latent as it's hypothetical, and we can hypothesize, that, that hypothesize their existence using uh, direct information uh, from the item that we can observe from the indicator. And the most common approximation of this about the measure issue is when some set of items have a correlation among them, then we can interpret this multiple correlation between uh, some set of items as a common factor. That is, that is the, the most important approach, that is very old approach about, about the, the, this kind of measurement issue about the, in order to capture latent variables. This is basically in the classical P theory in where we can, we can interpret this multiple correlation as a common variance. As at the true uh, the the true score, and and the 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 other part is the error variance, and in this case we going a little bit uh, uh, difference because not only now the the common correlation is this the separation of the variance could uh, could help the interpretation in order to separate the true cost, true score. And the error score, and in that case, we we can we can observe our latent variables with with these tools. Okay, what what is the, the main part of, of the of the information? What is the factor analysis? This, this idea of common factor is a set of methods oriented to explain the correlation among variables, which could be interpreted as, as latent variable factors. The existence of, of a common factor could explain the association among indicators. This is the, the, the typical conditional dependency uh, assumption in which if we partialize the, the existence of a latent variable or a factor, then the correlation that we can observe between or among indicators would be, would be zero. And in that case, we can interpret, in, interpret uh, our, our existence of correlation uh, as a common uh, element that could explain their existence, their, their associations. 
And th this is the main approach that, that we can use in order to interpret and measure our, our, our latent variables. And why, why this is important? Because, yeah, will allow us to observe these issues that we can observe. We cannot observe uh, directly. Yes, uh, yes, we can observe uh, indirectly through the, the specific items. And the purpose, the general purpose of, of this uh, uh, approach is uh, we, we, can, we can watch three, three main purposes. In one side, is reduce the, complete, the complexity and increase comprehension of the issues. For example, uh, about political participation, there is a lot of indicators uh, that, can indi that, that can show different behaviors about political participation. And there is a, at least 30 behaviors. And some behaviors are more related between each than others. If we can observe only uh, by separate each by one, uh, the complexity will be huge about how to understand the behavior of people. In that case, we can use this, this kind of uh, approaches, this, this kind of uh, reduced complexity using the structural equation modeling of factor analysis uh, in order to uh, increase comprehension and simplify the, the, the reality because in, an, in, an, in any other case, it's very, very difficult. Another, another purpose of, oh, in, in which we can use this kind of uh, approach is to validate scales and on increase, increase evidence about the scales that we use uh, in order to measure different constructs. Uh, because these techniques or this set of tools uh, have a lot of uh, elements that can, use, can be used in, in order to uh, uh, provide evidence about the validity of the scales, how works, how comparable uh, between groups is, uh, uh, the set of item, items that we select in order to measure some latent variables uh, are all use, use uh, we can use all items in order to measure this, this latent variable, or we can select some of the, some of it in order to explain in a better way our latent uh, construct. These different elements uh, helps in order to validate or increase the evidence in order to validate. Uh, from, from the scales. And in a more uh, specific or more technical issue, uh, the, the purpose is to separate the common variance and the unique variance. That, that is the, the more technical and more practical uh, uh, way in which we can understand the, the purpose of, of, the, of the homo factor approach. General foundations uh, is Base, are based in, in, the, in the typical statistical uh, uh, basis, covariance, correlation, partial correlation, may, mainly the most part of uh, elements that we can observe in the, in the, in the structural equation modeling tools uh, are based in this, in this idea. It's very important to understand this uh, in order to, uh, in order to apply this, this kind of techniques. Based mainly in simple and multiple correlation, it's very very easy when we we can understand the most part of uh, elements and and the the parameters and parameters that we can observe in the in the in the structural equation modeling when we think as a simple or multiple correlation because mainly are correlation and partial correlations most of, more, more part of the time and and because of that we we can uh, consider the general assumption of, of correlation in order to understand the the, the linear approach of a structural equation modeling. Of course, we can variation, we can have find variation here. For example, uh, there is a, a lot of development in, in categorical approach in order to uh, use these techniques, structural equation modeling using categorical data. Uh, but in any case, there is some corrections about the, about the, the properties of the matrix on how to build the matrix, based in linear correlation or based in the in the polycodical correlation, for example. Uh, in, in, in any case, the matrix are, are based in, in, in the, the typical assumptions. But this is just formation, the assumptions. We need at least intervalic measurement level. This is very difficult in social science. Uh, overall, when we measure uh, uh, attitudes all time or, or behaviors, 
uh, it's different when we, when we measure uh, knowledge, but in that case, it's another it's other set of techniques that uh, apply in there. Normality of the of the of the indicators that is very hard to to get, and sometimes we we can make some corrections about that when we, we don't have doesn't have uh, this kind of uh, assumption. Linear relation among variables that is a very important assumption uh, about the the in this approach, the the correlation or the association uh, uh, among variables must have certain level in order to make their the, its aggravation, and there are some rule of thumb about the, the the sample size. For example, we need at least two hundred cases. With less uh, than 200 cases, it, we have a, we will have a lot of limitations about the, the the complexity of the model, for example, or between five and, and ten uh, uh, cases for each variable. But these are only rule of thumbs, and we we have an, another problem when we have a huge samples because the most important uh, uh, indicator of a uh, fit index, uh, the chi square, is very sensible to the to the sample size. And in that case, all time we will have uh, some elements, and we we will have to observe the the, the sample size. It's important to discuss. Just for for discuss uh, very quickly the the typical representation uh, of uh, latent variables or or structural equation models. When we represent a latent variable, we can observe an an, an circle or an oval. That's very common and, and is an and is an, an, an common language today about the, how to make this representation. The observer value uh, variables or indicators are represented as square. The unidirectional path or regression path, we can we can say as a line with a with a with a arrow in the in the in one, one side only. We can represent the disturbances about one latent variable in here. Or disturbances or measurement error about the about the the one observer or uh, or observer value, and the correlation or covariance representation. In, we can observe as a line or as a or as a middle circle line with arrow in, in both extremes. This is important because not all time we can we can watch the the the, the diagram, but this is a kind of. Uh, Discussion that all time we can find in the different uh, textbooks. About the, the measurement uh, issue by one side, and here we can find at least three or the main three uh, techniques or approaches in, order in, in, the, in the context of a structural equation modeling or latent variable approach. Uh, the principal component analysis is not exactly a factor analysis. That is, that is a big discussion between some people uh, about if this is or our, our not a common a, a common factor approach. Uh, but the, the main characteristic of it is the definition of a, a common component from a linear combination of variables. And there is some difference from the other two approaches, the exploratory factor analysis and Descriptive technique, which allows to determine the number of latent factors uh, from a set of indicators, separating these common and unique variants in order to create one indicator, and the common factor analysis and the complementary factor analysis. Sorry, is a technique which allows to hypothesize the existence and uh, hopefully confirm the existence of a latent variable, specifying a set of parameters. How we can Compare this in a representation way. Uh, we can observe the principal component analysis. The line is from the indicators to the principal components. It's a, a, it's a, a linear combination or a average, weighted average. That, that is the typical way in which to approach the principal component analysis. And the main difference from the representation of exploratory and complementary factor analysis is the direction of the lines of, of, the, of the association. For example, in the principal component analysis, the direction of the line is from the indicators to the principal component. But in the factor analysis, it's the, 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 the direction of the prediction is from the latent or the factor analysis to the, to the uh, indicator. In, in this case, the existence of the factor explains the association between each uh, 
uh, indicated. And the difference between exploratory and confirmatory factor analysis is the parsimonious bits, because in here we explore and describe the the the, um, the existence of factor analysis, but it's not so clean because there is cross uh, loading in here. And in, in any case, we will have some cross loadings between indicators and factors. But in the in the uh, confirmatory factor analysis, we decide which is the model. Uh, and in here is very parsimonious way in which these indicators, X1, X2, and X3, are related because of the existence of factor one and X, uh, uh, the variable X4, X5, and F, uh, X6, uh, the correlation is explained by the factor two. And that is our hypothesis. And we can test the hypothesis in order to, to check if this model works or don't. Let's see. That, that is, that is the, the main question that we can use. And here we can uh, replace the number factor as a latent or dimension, but that is the main idea. And beyond the measurement issues, we have the structural issue or the structural equation model, or full structural equation model, which we will have the measurement model part that we can observe the existence of the factor one is uh, explain the, the, the association uh, between Y1 and Y2, but after that, we can put in relation the factor one and factor two, the latent uh, factors. And in that case, we will have the, the full uh, structural equation model. This is only our presentation because we have a lot of options. For example, this is a full structural equation model, only latent variable playing between each. Uh, or for example, we have another option in where we, in a first step, we evaluate three latent variables. Uh, based in the in this observed indicator and its association between each, and in a second step, but this is happening in only in one in one step in, in, in one estimation, we can use observing indicators to explain these latent variables. Another option that we can use in this case is, for example, latent variable predicting observing indicator. That is another way to to think this, and in here we can, uh, as we can as we can see. Is not only uh, a regression. In here, we we have more complex association. For example, this is a kind of mediation uh, uh, analysis in where poor physical health is, uh, uh, is connected with poor physical, uh, poor psychosocial health uh, through personal mobility. This is an, an example that we can find in, in Baojian text about the structural equation modeling. And the other option is path analysis, where we have only observed uh, variables and we can make a relation uh, about that. And what about parsimony? Because this is for, for me, it's very important uh, the idea of parsimony, the idea of simplifying the reality. And after simplifying the, the reality, to try to explain the relation between different elements and try to simplify the measure because we have too much complexity in reality. After that, we can observe uh, models like this in, in where it's very, very difficult to follow what is the relation, the relevant relation about different elements. This is a Christ cross <laughs> uh, uh, growth modeling uh, between different variables in three times related between each and using latent variables uh, approach. It, it just, just for saying, all time, we, we have to keep in mind all time the, the parsimony in order to explain. Because for me, it's very difficult to diagram a kind of a picture like this and explain after that what is the relation, the main important point about this. Okay, about the estimation process, I'm going to be fast about the, the, this part. Um, uh, we have uh, some step in order to estimate CFA and structural equation model. And in our first part is the model specification. This is the most important part for me and, and try to uh, transmit this, this idea. It's the moment in where when we think about the theoretical uh, relation, about the latent association, about the, about the, the construct that we will use and how this 
are over-rationalized. This is the theoretical moment and the model specification. What will be the hypothesis that the hypothesis that we, we will put in the in the in the model? And after that, we can take the data and, and the, the, the most part of uh, elements, practical elements. But the, the theoretical moment is very important in order to, to uh, put uh, which will be the model that we will test. After that, we, 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 we need to check the, the identification of the model. This, this is a part mainly about we have enough information in order to make this estimation. For example, we have enough indicator indicators in order to uh, uh, estimate on Lechenberg. We have enough information and uh, we have enough cases in, in order to make an, our estimation. If we have uh, uh, enough information, we can follow in order to make the estimation and evaluate the adequation of the model. If we don't have, we, we need to think again uh, if we, we, this is the, 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 the proper approach in order to make this. And when we estimate the model, uh, when we made the model specification, we need to check the adequation of the model. If, if our, our hypothetical model uh, uh, found uh, evidence in order to use in our data, in order to confirm or unconfirm our hypothesis about the measure or about the relation between latent and barrel. If the information about the, the adequation, if we have information in favor about our, our hypothetical model, then we can interpret the estimate. In any other case, if we, if we don't have uh, information about the adequation of the, of the fit index indexes, uh, the interpretation of the estimate is poor and, and spurial sometimes. Yes. And after this the interpretation, we can consider another options like equivalence between the model comparing, for example, uh, between groups or across countries, that is another kind of uh, questions. And finally, report the, the results. Then we today we, we will go step by step about this, uh, expressing the hypothesis and equations. That is the, the first part of, of the of the of this nation of, of the process. And we I will discuss a little bit about the one hypothetical model that, that I work for some some years now in, in my in my uh, doctoral studies I, I use this this approach and after that I will show a little bit about the estimation process using R and using M plus and explain a little bit about this and in order to estimate the each hypothesized parameter and interpretation of the fit indexes in order to uh, evaluate if the hypothetical model works or don't. And after that, I will show a little bit about the report. Okay, a little bit about hands-on. Only, only saying a little bit, you, you can find in the, in the link that uh, Pamela shared with, with all. Uh, the an HTML uh, report in where you can uh, find the example that I use in, in this presentation. In order to replication, you can find the data, the codes, and the results. If, if you want to try another things, and if you have, the, the only important thing is you need R and M plus, both of them. Because the, this, this session is based in the, in, in, in both, in both uh, programs. Uh, I will speak a little bit why why you, we still using in plus if we have some free software like R, <laughs> for example, and Laban, which is the package in where we we can uh, make the most part of uh, analysis that that we, that that we will show now. Okay, the first is the example of CFA. I will estimate this model. This is the the real representation of the model. It's a um, free. Uh, dimensional model of uh, citizen participation, youth citizen participation. This is turnout because this is TUR uh, or voting behavior or intention to vote behavior uh, based in three indicators. This is legal act activist uh, participation based in four indicators. And this is illegal uh, activist participation. 
erase it in three indicators. This is uh, the, the more part, the, 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 the hypothetical model that I will test using some data. Just some hypot yet, and theoretical explanation or discussion about synthesis of motivation. It's very, very brief uh, discussion about the, the, the first part of, part of the estimation. Uh, here I, I will use the, the hypothetical model that I think for, for some time uh, in order to capture the complexity of participation in youth population. And youth population have different problems than the other population. For example, youth people, youth students, the student doesn't have uh, the right to vote. Because of that, it's very difficult to measure formal participation in, in, in young people, uh, people less than 18. In most part of countries, because in most part of countries, uh, the legal age to vote is 18. We have only some cases in where it's 16, and we have other cases in where it's 21, even today. Uh, but this is an important issue because if we want to measure formal participation, traditional way of participation in young people, we don't have options because people, uh, students doesn't vote in general, doesn't vote in national in national uh, election, in community, local elections, or even doesn't uh, receive information about the, about the elections. Sometimes participate in some elections in the in the schools, but it's not exactly the same. Because of that, I think it's important to use future intentions to participate. In here, the intentions have a justification in order to use it. Another difference, uh, depending, of the, depending of the age, is the opportunity to participate in, in activities. Activities, for example, are very limited. Depending, for example, at 12, the most part of the students doesn't participate in those things, doesn't have experience participating in legal or in legal participation. But at 16, it's different. Uh, the student will have different uh, opportunities and, and, and options to participate. Because of that, again, it's, not, you know, it's just for justify the, the use of intentions to participate. And, and another element to discuss this is the different dimensions to go with different options to exert citizenship. It's a huge discussion about this, about the, the different dimension of participation. And in here, I will use, and you can read a lot of these dimensions. We have the formal part of participation, the relation with the state, mainly, how, how people uh, relate with the state, mainly uh, through voting or uh, mem uh, doing members in membership in the party, parties, for example. And other important part of uh, the citizenship is the, the, the contentious politics. And in here, the, in the contentious issues, we can find at, at least one distinction, the legal part or the conventional part, a set of uh, in, uh, behaviors that are uh, allowed to, to do uh, in which students or people can involve, and the legal part. And that is another kind of uh, behavior in which people can involve. Just for saying, this is the, the, the model that I will test. The model. Three uh, uh, dimension of participation observed with three indicators for formal, four indicators for legal activities, and three indicators for uh, illegal activities. And just an explanation of the data is International Civic and Citizenship Study 2016 and merged with the National Involved Evaluation. This allow two elements. For example, in the, in the first step, uh, the, the evaluation of the model that I, that, that I showed right now. And in a second step, we can evaluate the relation between a uh, specific variables uh, uh, and its impacts on uh, young citizen participation. For example, they evaluate their, how reading skills impact on participation. There is some line about that, some development that in, in which I participate with, with other people to try to discuss how they reading skills, this kind of uh, uh, specific skill which is developed in the schools, uh, could impact in citizenship. And there is some literature about, about that. In order to evaluate formal participation, when you're adults, what do you think you will do? This is three indicators. 
you will think you will vote in both in national election, local election, and get information about candidate and the probability of do that. And you need to pre-code in this uh, 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 scales because it's in the reverse. And about the activist participation, legal and illegal, I will use the first four uh, elements. I use only this first four because the other elements are related to online issues. Because of, that, because of that, I use the first four. Talk to others about the, the your political views, contact your representative, take part in a peaceful march or rally, and collect signatures or petition. This is very traditional way in which to measure the conventional activism. And unconventional or illegal uh, activists, I will measure in order to, using this tree. The disposition to, to spray paint, uh, protest slogan and words, protest blocking uh, the traffic and occupy uh, public buildings using the Italian, Italian sample. Okay. Now I will combine the part of the code and in the first step, we can observe the, the, the mean and the for activists, the mean is very low. For formal activists or legal activists, it's in the middle. And the, for formal participation, is a little bit high. And that is the just for description of the data. Uh, about the correlation, yeah, this, is, this is a way to explore the correlation, but I will show the, the, the graphical way in, in, to explore the correlation. And in here, we can observe, for example, the Activists, the illegal participation have more higher correlation than between the other, and the peaceful participation have higher correlation between each, and formal participation higher correlation than with, than with the other. And in here we can anticipate the, the good uh, works of the of the uh, measurement model. This is the way in which in M plus we can create the the in, in R, we can create the M plus syntax. We use this code in order to create the M plus syntax. We recreate the M plus syntax in the uh, M plus tournament and turn. Uh, in where we can find the title variable. In here, we can uh, specify the, the design cluster at the school, the certification, Jackson's weight, total weight, a type of analysis complex. In here, we can specify the three latent variables. Turn out by the three formal variables, uh, indicators, legal activities, and illegal activities. And this is the code to create the model in M+. This, this create the, 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 the input file to M+. Daniel? Yes? Uh, just, just to say that we are uh, over the time now. We, we have been granted another 15 minutes. To finish, I, I assume it's going to be uh, enough for just to give you a heads up. Yeah, thank you. And and the participants, of course, uh, just just for you to know that we're close to to yeah. it. Very well. And this is a picture about the input file syntax in M plus. This is the, the a picture of the M plus and how how is created by by R. Okay. Just, just for saying. After that, in the final part, I will show a little bit about about how how is uh, in the input and output file. And we can uh, rep make a representation using the same plots, basically in the same plots uh, package, which take the model that we specify, and in here we we can the, we made the representation of the model. It's very easy because it's, we, we, we don't have to draw line by line. This is an a automatic uh, picture of the model. Yes, for the, 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 the output about the result, this is the descriptive, univariate descriptive information is exactly the same that we can observe using R, but now it's basically in the, in the, in the output file of the, of the M plus, and we're gonna observe again the same pattern in where the mean of the activist but illegal participation is lower, middle in the illegal participation, and the higher in the formal participation. What about the evaluation of the model? And in here we have to observe the output file in M plus, and in M plus we, we will have a lot of information about the fit indexes, 
the most important elements are three. The chi-square test of model fit, in where we can observe the test of chi-square, uh, and the interpretation is high, high value poor adjustment. And the null model is that the matrix that we that we estimate based in our hypothetical model is very close to the sample matrix. And in this uh, part, we don't want to reject the, the null hypothesis. And what happened here? The p-value is very, very low. The probability that these two matrix, the hypothetical matrix and the real matrix or the sample matrix uh, are similar, it's very, very low. In that case, we rejected the, the, the hypothetical, uh, our hypothetical model. And that happened a lot, this, this part, because chi square is very, very, very sensible to the sample size. In this, ca in this case, we have 3,000 more cases. Because of that, uh, was developed a lot of uh, or different uh, fit index. We, here, we, we, we can observe the comparative fit index, the CFI and TLI, uh, and which interpretation is if closer than one is better, and the cutoff point is around zero uh, or 0.95. That is, that is the typical agreement about the, which is the cutoff point. But we can observe in different uh, publications, we can observe a little bit less, but never less than uh, 0.90. That is the real, real cutoff point. It depends on the complexity of the model. And the other indicator is RMSA, uh, in which case, when, when it's closer than zero is better, lower than uh, 0 0.05 is considered a good model and less than that is a better model. It's a kind of parsimony correction. Uh, uh, and in, in this case, we have to report and interpret the three elements, the CFI higher than nine, uh, 95, 0.95, TLI higher than 945, in, in this case it's 943, uh, uh, 0.93, sorry. And the RMSA is closer than 0 0.5, okay? In, in this case, we can say that this is a good model. Have, may, may, maybe we can increase or, or improve a little bit, but it's a good model. And after that, we can make the interpretation of the loadings in this case, the standardized model results, the loadings of the turnout or formal participation are pretty well, legal participation and illegal participation, and the, the association between these latent variables. And here we can observe the R square and just to analyze which indicators could, uh, could be removed or, or but in, in that case, we have another options. This is just one way to uh, extract the information from R uh, uh, to M plus in order and, and show in the in the same interval. Uh, and in and, and in this case, we get, we will have the same information. And here, for example, we have the fit indexes information, the observations, the fit indexes, chi square, and in here we 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 will observe the the. Uh, factor loadings and the other information about the matrix. And just for saying, we can use as a slave the M plus from R. The, and the second example is just an improve, improvement on the, of the same model. We will use the same model and we, we will explain the three part, type of participation by reading skills, gender, and education of parents. We estimate the model the same way just create an uh, M plus input file and generate the input and output file and estimations. And after that, we can extract the information and what we can say here, for example, turnout is predicted by uh, higher education, higher educated pattern impact on uh, formal participation, little bit on legal participation, but doesn't have a, a relation with illegal participation. Uh, what, what happened about Italy, the reading skills measured in the Italian evaluation of uh, 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 test. In here, the Italian evaluation test is positively related with formal participation, 
is not related with legal in, uh, participation, but is negatively related with Italian, uh, with the illegal participation. The students that have higher skills uh, of reading have less disposition to participate in illegal ways. That, that is the main interpretation. It's just a way to interpret this, the, the result that we have in here. So extension of this, we, we can use confirmatory factor analysis in order to put constraints, equivalence or measurement variance or equivalence across countries or, or across groups. Measurement model with categorical indicators, that is another approach in, in, in which uh, we use this kind of uh, techniques. And in, in the way to use a structural equation modeling, we, we, we can estimate mediation model or more complex model multi-level uh, uh, structural equation modeling. That is another way to use. And the longitudinal modeling cross lab or later group or the other options that we, we can find. Why, why we use in plus that's for clothing? Because in plus have the most, the old element we can use. We can specify the complex design. We can use the plausible values and the structural equation approach. That, is not allowed for now in a uh, Laman package or in any other uh, software that I know uh, for free, at least, <laughs> except in plus. Um, that is my presentation just for showing. You can find, no, it's okay. You're, uh, just for repeating, you can find the the, the practice or, or the code and, and data in the in the files that, that we share. If you have any doubt, a question or, or queries, you can write us and we can share uh, information about this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel. And, uh, and with that, we're gonna close the, the session. We are uh, over the time, but as Daniel said, uh, please do not hesitate to send us any questions, comments that you have. Uh, go to the GitHub uh, webpage, try to replicate the code. And uh, if you have any questions while doing that, please do not hesitate to contact us. Thank you very much for coming and I'll see you in the next following sessions. <laughs>